So um, if if you had to, if you if I had to ask, if you let me start over. If I had to answer a question, if somebody said to me, "What is the most misunderstood Christian doctrine?" I might I might answer the virgin birth because I don't think it is understood very well. It's certainly not understood by um, by its critics, and I think even even believers uh, don't understand it as well as they should because it has so much to offer us. And so um, that's what I want to talk about today. The, 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 the virgin birth is this idea that goes back um, really uh, before the time the Gospels were, were set down. We know that because there's two separate traditions. There's, there's a tradition that Matthew records in his, in his Gospel account and also one that Luke records. So, so we know it's a very early tradition within the church. People were already talking about this. Uh, even before the time the Gospels were first written, and it goes on through the through the uh, centuries that followed. It was one of it was put down in the um, first ecumenical uh, uh, creed when when the church was first legalized in the Roman Empire. Uh, one of the first things they did was was declare that uh, Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. So it's an old doctrine, and yet its its critics have are, are equally old. It was, it was being criticized already in the second century, and um, it was criticized as recently as the, the, the Jesus Seminar in the last century, and, and even more recently in the past couple of decades. There have been critics who have said, no, it's some, some fanciful telling or something like that. They, they say it's, it's not a real thing, that it didn't actually happen. And so there's, there's critics, but I think even, even um, believers don't get as much out of it as they could. I think a lot of believers look at it and they say, I don't understand that could happen, but it's just kind of an FYI to me, so it doesn't matter. So whatever it is, you know, I, I don't have to, uh, to worry about that. And I think that uh, part, of, part of the problem, especially for non-believers, but for believers too, is the idea that people back in the olden days were, were kind of ignorant, and they didn't understand about gametes and zygotes and DNA and all the things we understand today. But, you know, that's chronological snobbery. Because, because they did understand women didn't have babies without help. So that's not a new discovery in the past couple of decades. That's something people have known for a long time. So, so this, this, I guess, a debate between believers and non-believers has gone on. But I think the believers are missing the, the point because it's not simply an FYI. It's not something, hey, this is an interesting thing about Jesus. There is something in it that, that will actually... Uh, help us today, and that's what I want to talk about today, is the, what how, how the virgin birth actually speaks to us in our current uh, situation. So we're going to look at the virgin birth today. We are in this um, uh, conversation called Ho- uh, um, Holiday Travelers, and we began a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the story of Gabriel, how Gabriel came to tell Zechariah the good news about Jesus, that, that he was going to have a son, and his son would be the, the, the prophet who announced the coming of Jesus. So, so uh, we, we saw that, but we also learned that uh, we can all be angels in that sense because Jesus calls each of us to bear witness to him, that we're called to be his witnesses. So if an angel is anybody who brings good news from God, then we can all be angels in that sense. So we learned that, and then last week we looked at the Magi, and the story of the Magi is that is that God met them where they were. They didn't have to come to Jerusalem, and then God showed them a star. God showed them a star out wherever they were, someplace in the east. God came to them and spoke to them in their own language because God wants to draw everybody to Jesus. So we looked at that, and today we're going to look at the story of Mary and see how the the idea of the um, virgin birth um, is helpful to us. So. We begin in um, Luke's Gospel, starting in verse 26, and uh, we're going to read about half of it, and you're welcome to read the second half when when, um, we finish, Uh, but um, I'm just going to read the little bit we've got today. So so, um, we read that um, when Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. So uh, Luke starts on just right there. So Gabriel, he's already told us about, he was the one who came to Zechariah and told him that his wife Elizabeth would have a baby. Time has passed. Elizabeth is now six months pregnant, and Gabriel gets sent again. 
But as I mentioned to the children, he's not sent to, to the, the center of the religion. He's not sent to the religious establishment and people who had important positions in it. He's sent to kind of just a town. I mean, not, not especially obscure, but not, not very well known either. So this obscure town, I mean, kind of obscure town, uh, off in Galilee, far from the center of the religion. And he goes not to a priest, not to a man, not to an old person, but to a young girl or a young woman. Um, and uh, um, so, so uh, Gabriel comes to her uh, and um, we read that she is a virgin who's engaged to a man named Joseph. In the first century in this culture, uh, uh, um, engagement lasted about a year and it was a very formal thing. Um, you know, documents were filed and things like that. Um, in order to be, in order to be, uh, to break it off, you didn't just get your ring back. You actually had to do a divorce proceeding. So, so, um, so they are they're they're um, engaged, but not yet living together. And um, we read her um, that her uh, fiance Joseph is a descendant of David's uh, David's house. So King David lived a thousand years ago. There's probably a lot of descendants of King David because um, that's what happens in a thousand years. Uh, we don't know how many, but he's one of them. And the angel comes to her and he says, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. And she was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The word rejoice is the, the standard way people talk to each other. You know, it's, they, would, they would greet each other and say rejoice, um, which kind of seems odd to us. But he says, hey, you know, hi, yo, um, hi, favored one. The Lord is with you. And she's wondering, well, I got the, the greeting part, but what's favored one and the Lord being with me? And the angel explains. He says, don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever and there will be no end to his kingdom. So he just opens up his mouth and all of these promises come out. So so blah, 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 just kind of spills out of him. So she's going to have a baby, um, and she'll name him Jesus, and he'll be great, the son of the Most High. Um, but not just that, the Lord will give him the throne. The, it's been 600 years since a descendant of David sat in the throne in Israel. And God will give him the throne of David, and he will rule over Jacob's house, so all the people of Israel, and there will be no end to his kingdom. So quite a lot of promises. But Mary is stuck on the first part of that. She, she doesn't boggle over the, the king, kingdom and throne and so forth. She, she says, wait, hold on. <laughs> How will this happen since I haven't had sexual relations with a man? So maybe she's thinking, you know, are we talking about something that will happen after, Dave, uh, after uh, Joseph and I uh, move in together? You know, what, what do you, you know, explain to me what it is you mean. And um, the angel says... The Holy Spirit will come over you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So that clears everything up. <laughs> so, so it's not really an explanation. It's, it's really just an assurance. Yeah, God's got this. God knows more about um, uh, pregnancy than you do. God knows more about it than snobby people in the 21st century do. God knows all about pregnancy. And the proof of that is... Look, even in her old age, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. This woman who is labeled unable to conceive, the people who said that, well, guess what? The joke is on them because she's six months pregnant now. And then he concludes by saying, nothing is impossible with God. And Mary says, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. And the angel left her. And Mary got up and hurried to a city in the Judean highlands. So she's going to go talk to Elizabeth, and you can, you can look at that at your leisure. But what I want to do is I want to talk about this promise, this promise that, uh, that the angel has made to, to, um, to Mary. And it is this, this uh, promise that she will have a child, and it is where we get the doctrine of the virgin birth. He's saying, no, you're going to have a baby because of this... Uh, overshadowing and, and um, coming over you. So however that works, that's how you're going to have a baby, not the usual way. And he says, nothing is impossible with God. 
And the reason I want to talk about this is because that's what all of us are hoping, or at least have hoped at some point. All of us have said, is that true? Is it true that nothing is impossible for God? There's a, um, there's a I don't know what he is, he's a religious guy with a podcast in England. His name is uh, Glenn Scrivener, and he wrote a book called The Air We Breathe, and it's talking about how we live in a Christian culture, even if um, nobody we know goes to church. They, they just absorb Christianity in, in you know, the air we breathe. And he said, he said, most people who come to church on any given day did not come from pure motives. They did not simply come because they said, I came to, to, uh, pray, to, to offer praise and glory to the living God. Most people come to church because they've got mixed motives, that there's something they want from God. There's something we want from God. We, 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 we say prayers, right? We ask God for things. We're hoping God can deliver because, because we're fresh out of ideas. You know, our marriage is, is not what it ought to be. It, maybe it's, it's coming to an end and we're fresh out of ideas and we're hoping that God has something that, that he can do about this. We, we have problems with our health. The, the doctor told us, you know, this is, this is going to be permanent. You're going to have to learn to live with this. We've got problems with our health. We've got, we've got problems with our finances. There's something that's keeping us awake, keeping us from having any kind of peace. And we're hoping that somehow, that, that God can somehow intervene in our finances and help us get on top of whatever's going on there. Sometimes we come to church just because we're lonely and we want to be part of a community and we hope that God can connect us with people so we can have friends. And sometimes we come to church and what we're hoping is that God can help us deal with our past because of what we did to somebody else or what somebody else did to us. And we're hoping that somehow God can do something with the shame or the guilt that we've been carrying. And we all, we all have these mixed motives from time to time. Maybe not all of us every week, but it's very typical. And, and really, it's not a bad thing to have mixed motives. God calls us to pray. God wants to restore a relationship where we come to Him with our problems. There's nothing wrong with it. But we don't simply come to church to worship God. We come to, to church because we hope God can help fix some kind of a problem we're dealing with. And so we're hoping that Gabriel was telling the truth, that nothing is impossible with God. And that's what the virgin birth, that's what we understand because of the virgin birth. Because the virgin birth is the idea that God comes into a world that is a mess. God comes into a person who is flawed and produces from her something that is flawless, something that is without sin, that is uncorrupted. In a corrupt world, God can reach down and bring about perfection. That is the central idea of the Christian faith, really, that that is what God is doing on a grand scale throughout the world, that God is coming into a world that is a mess, a world full of violence and heartache and loss, and producing something that is perfect. Now, I don't mean to say anything bad about Mary. I know some of us come from traditions that, that say Mary was not imperfect, that Mary was sinless, that, that she was uh, without um, original sin or personal sin, and there's debates among different traditions that say that. I, I am unpersuaded by the, the arguments there. Um, I think Mary was uh, like the rest of us, but, but that's okay. I could be wrong, right? I could be wrong. But then we're only arguing about when it happened, right? If God made a perfect Mary, He started with her imperfect parents. So we're only arguing about where God did this intervention in order to bring about the perfect man, Jesus. So we believe, who, who believe the, the, the virgin birth, believe that this is what God did. God reached into a flawed person. God reached into a flawed humanity and brought about 
the perfect humanity. You know, there's the saying, if all you've got is lemons, you should make lemonade. But this is more than that. This is saying, what if the lemons are spoiled? What if all you've got is rotten lemons? What do you do then? Right? And the virgin birth is the idea God can reach into a flawed humanity and bring about perfection. I, in my first career, I was a, I was an, I, I was, a, we called ourselves software engineers. We were programmers, but um, I, I worked with a lot of engineers, people who understood electrical engineering and chemistry and all kinds of types of engineering. And they have a word, they have a word which is entropy. And entropy is the idea that everything in the world runs down. That since the Big Bang, everything has just been kind of coming to an end. And, and we, you know, some, some practical examples of this, you know, if you think about it, uh, a, a fire can burn all on its own. Nobody has to, to do anything to keep a fire burning. Um, uh, you know, as long as there's fuel, a fire will burn. A piece of wood will burn until it's completely gone. But it takes sunlight for a tree to make wood, right? Trees don't just spontaneously grow wood. They, they, need, they need the energy of the sun to come in and sort things out. I mean, to, to help them produce that. Um, mountains, you know, uh, rocks fall down and mountains that get that uh, angle of repose, right? It, they don't build themselves up, right? Mountains don't do that unless there's energy, like, you know, in a volcano where it's coming up from below. So this idea of in entropy is this idea that, that things run down, that if, if the world is a clock, that it's been, it's been ticking away and unwinding all this time. So, so there's this idea that we have of entropy. And we might look at the world and say, well, yeah, the world's kind of like that. But, but what Christianity tells us is that God reaches into a world that is running down and doesn't simply wind the clock back up. God changes it to a world that doesn't run down. That's our hope, that, that God changes people. God brings out of the world that runs down people who do not run down. God brings out of a world full of lemons, lemons that are no longer spoiled. God actually works if you think of that analogy of wood that burns up, right? God takes wood that burns up and turns it into wood that burns but is never burnt up. If you think of the story of Moses, he turned aside because he saw the bush that was burning but was not consumed. God changes the way the world works, one person at a time. This is our hope that God can do the impossible. All those things are impossible because of entropy. Right? The world does run down, but we believe that God can do the impossible. God can turn things that don't work into things that do, things that are corrupt into things that are uncorrupted. God can do that in your marriage. God can turn a lousy marriage into one that is better, one that is actually a good marriage, one that actually reflects God's intention for humanity. We, God, God, can, God can take your finances and transform them from something that keeps you up at night into something that you find peace and joy in. God can take your loneliness and produce community and friendship. God can take your, your pain, your guilt, your shame, and transform you into a new person. The virgin birth teaches us that what Gabriel said is true. Nothing is impossible with God. God wants to work in each of us to make our little piece of this corrupt world uncorrupted, to make that part of our world perfect. And when we, when we do that, we, when that happens in our lives, that is an echo of the great miracle, which is the virgin birth. Nothing is impossible with God. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you with mixed motives. Some of us 
came just to worship you today and give you praise and glory. But some of us have hopes because there are things in our lives, there are things in us that we don't know how to deal with. And it is our hope that in the same way you took flawed humanity and brought about a perfect human being, you can work in us and our situations and bring goodness out of a corrupt and evil world. We pray that you would do this and help us to see it so that we can testify to it. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Thank <laughs> you.